Have you ever wondered how you can be more creative and think about things outside the box? That's what we'll talk about today. The worst enemy to creativity is self-doubt. Sylvia Plath. Today we're going to talk about the book by John Cleese, Creativity, A Short and Cheerful Guide. I always admire people who can be creative. I don't feel that I'm really that creative. But I guess if I think about it, I'm creative when it comes to troubleshooting, when it comes to problem solving. So I think that maybe I'm thinking about creativity all wrong. And that's what I thought this book would be helpful in clearing up some ideas about creativity and how we can be more creative. He says initially that most people think about the arts when they think about creativity. And that's why when you ask them if they're creative, they think they're not because maybe they're not good actors. They're not great at the arts. They can't do anything that you think of when you think about creative people. And he says that's just not even true. He says, quote, creativity can be seen in every area of life, in science or in business or in sport. Wherever you can find a way of doing things that is better than what has been done before, you are being creative. And I thought, that's it. It's not just about the arts, which is my problem when I think about creativity. It's about all the things where you have to think outside the box. Just even hearing that made me feel better about my own level of creativity. He also says it's not something that we're born with. Sometimes people think that people are born with a sort of creative skill and they're just meant from birth to be a creative individual. That it's something that you put work into. He says often that if he puts in some creativity time before he goes to bed, he will solve his problems creatively while he sleeps. At first, he felt it was like a gift or something that he was doing, but then he realized it's not a gift, but that it just keeps working on things all the time, even when we're asleep. And that's what the unconscious is. We're so aware in society about what conscious thought is, about something that we decide ahead of time how we're going to think about something. It is still unknown to us and unknown to scientists about what the unconscious is. We've tried to define it. We've tried to decide if it's been the same thing all along or has it changed when people have changed. And then we find out that even if we don't understand exactly what the unconscious is, it's still there. It's still doing its work. And if we can tune it to make it help us in the best possible way, we will be more creative. He kind of gives it an example of our stomach. When we eat, we don't really know how the stomach works, but you know what? It does its job, regardless of what we think about it. We can help our digestive process by eating properly or eating at the right time, but it still works, whether we're conscious of it or not. He thinks that this whole unconscious process is really amazing. The backbone of all our problem solving, all of the things that help us to become better more creative human beings. Not something we can order around, and that's the problem with it. We don't really understand what it takes, and we don't feel like we can master it because it kind of does what it wants to do in the time it wants to do it. All we can do is learn how to read what our unconscious mind is telling us, what all the messages it's trying to say so we can make better decisions and be more creative in the way we make decisions. The key here is that it's not a language that's spoken out loud. It's not something that we can listen to in the same way we listen to a conversation. It just gives us a little boost here and there, an idea. Even if you don't really know what it is it's trying to do, it hints in all sorts of nonverbal ways what it thinks we should be doing thought that the problem is, is that when we go to school, school is all about teaching our conscious mind. It's all about problem solving up front, how our brain thinks, being a logical person, but it never really goes after what's going on with the unconscious thought. Because it's the most powerful tool that we have, it's really avoiding something that could help us throughout our entire lives. He thinks that our unconscious mind is just as smart 
or intelligent as our conscious mind. And it's very much like the tortoise and the hare fable where the fast rabbit is the conscious mind, directive, going at the thing that it really wants. But the tortoise mind, the unconscious mind, maybe seems like it's not going to win or it's not going to finish ahead of time, but it is getting there in its own speed, in its own way, and it will eventually give you that good decision, the good thought, or some hints about how to go about something. We don't even really understand how to take that into our consideration when we're trying to make decisions or solve something. He says that our conscious mind is something that is really good at taking a goal and going after it, really figuring out a complex problem. But our unconscious mind is maybe what we would call wisdom, something where it's not taking book learning necessarily, not taking something that is a logical thought process, but yet still figuring out through this deep wisdom how to get things done. He mentions another good book by Guy Claxton called Tortoise Mind, and it's about the same process of the creative versus the practical, how we need both of those types of minds. We can build a beautiful building, he says, but if it doesn't have good structure, it will fall down. And another fellow named Donald McKinnon talked to architects and tried to figure out what they do all day long. How is it that they plan about building amazing buildings? He said, first of all, a good architect who's creative knew how to play, dabble, and almost have that childlike spirit. Then the second point that the good architect always did is they tried to put off making a decision as long as possible. They didn't come down to a decision until they really had to, and that would give their unconscious mind this playability, this puzzling, this tortoise mind a chance to catch up and think of some really creative ways of solving problems or making something more beautiful or more functional. It's that delay that allows that creativity time in the unconscious mind to happen. He says children are great at this because they don't have rules. We feel like when we get to work every morning, we have to sit at our desk, get our coffee, get a snack, wear the right clothes, sit at the proper desk. We give it a lot of rules, but children don't have those rules. They play. The play has no purpose. It's free from any kind of stress or worry or anything that it's thinking about. Adults just don't have that ability anymore because we think about all our responsibilities and we've lost that creative edge. He said that when we postpone those decisions like the architect, it gives that childlike mind room to develop strategies or nudge us in the right direction. As adults, we tend to dislike when we're unstructured or we have a vague thought that doesn't really have any logical sense to it or rules or reasons to it. If we would let ourselves just accept the fact that this creative unconscious mind needs a little bit of time, eventually the right answer will come through. It's like we've talked about in other podcasts that when you go for a walk, maybe in the woods, suddenly the right answer comes along, even if you're not thinking about the problem you're trying to solve. Or again, his analogy when he's sleeping, how he can give his brain a problem and he wakes up either from a nap or a bedtime sleep with the right answer. It's almost like when you don't focus on the question, your brain does the real work of finding the answer to the question. Now, of course, he says there has to be a cutoff. We have to come to a conclusion and we have to make a decision. So there will be some point in it, but at least give your brain as much time as possible to come to that answer. He says that it's kind of a weird thing to give our brain this very sharp deadline when we could maybe give it a little bit more time because if you give your brain a little bit more time, maybe new information will come along. You might get new ideas. You might think new thoughts. You might talk to a new person. So why be so forced into coming up with a decision right now when you really don't have to? I know for me, and a lot of times being a planning type of person, when it comes to something even like a vacation, I think about 
where I'm going to take my vacation this year. And I start thinking about it in generalities. But if I'm not going to make hotel reservations this early, or I'm not going to buy tickets on a plane this early, why bother forcing myself into a decision? There have been times where I've decided that I'm going to go on vacation to a national park only to find out it had flooding or fire and I really couldn't go there. But by making that decision and forcing my brain into that path so early, it almost seems disappointing when I can't do that thing. When instead I could have delayed the decision and taken in more data and come up with other vacations that would have been better solutions at that time with those circumstances. So he says that a lot of times creative people are just better at this uncomfort of not having a decision, of leaving some things just out there that we haven't decided. And once you can get to that point when you don't feel like you need a decision at that exact moment, you'll be able to come up with better ideas and more creative ways of going about things. The other point he brings up is that interruptions are terrible for us. Constantly get interrupted if we're always being bugged or there's noise or there's something going on. I'm someone that when I'm not recording podcasts, I'm listening to podcasts. And so I do have a lot of disruptions because I don't give myself a lot of quiet time to think. He's saying that those interruptions are actually so damaging to the creativity in our brain. Because it's almost distracting our conscious and our unconscious brain away from thinking about our problem solving that we hope that it's trying to figure out. Even by worrying about the fact that there's going to be interruptions is enough of an interruption by itself where we can't get anything done. We have to create this area where it has time to think, where it has the space to think, and it has that lack of interruption so that it can come up with a quality decision. If you can dedicate some time to creative thinking where maybe you set up a timer or you know that you're going to do this for the next hour, you'll respect the time, you won't have interruptions, and then that's when your brain can play, be creative, think outside the box. Again, if you decide you're going to go for a walk and that you know you have that time to think about your problem, you'll learn that that time is dedicated to being more creative. Once you start getting rid of these distracting thoughts, these interrupting thoughts that are crushing our creativity, you'll get better and better at it, and your brain will start to calm down. And once it settles, and once it starts being able to focus on the question at hand with some peace and some quiet and some focus, you'll start being able to come up with better thoughts more quickly because it knows that you're going to respect its thinking time. It makes me think of the app Headspace. I'm really not much of a meditator, though I use the Headspace app for sleeping. But one of the things that it tries to get you to do when you're overwhelmed with thoughts is to think of the thoughts as clouds and push them away so they're not interrupting you. You're not telling yourself, don't think about this, because you know as soon as you tell yourself not to think about something, it's all you're ever going to think about. Instead, you're just pushing it out of the way for now. You're doing something that they call labeling, where you're saying, oh, there's a thought, there's a worry, there's a to-do list item. And as soon as you label it, somehow your mind is able to get back to its peaceful Focus on other things. And as soon as you start getting that peace and that quiet, he says that's when the solution to problems come in, when odd thoughts come in, when creative strategies come in, and that's your unconscious mind being able to send a more clear message about what it is you need to do, how you need to solve the problem. And by allowing that to happen, you can be more creative. These types of creative ideas come in as images. They don't come in really as words. They just sort of speak this unconscious language of ideas or dreams or visions because our unconscious mind doesn't have that way of speaking that our conscious mind has. 
And so we just have to learn how to be able to read the unconscious mind better and to be more quiet and listen to it. He says that that logical brain tries to sort everything and put it in order and make it like a library where everything has its place. But the unconscious mind does a little bit better at these obscure thoughts, these unstructured thinking, these play times. And the more quiet we can be, the better we'll do at hearing that unconscious mind speak to us. If you struggle like I do at being quiet, having quiet time, or giving yourself a dedicated time to just think about something in a relaxing way, noodling something without really forcing yourself into a decision, it's going to be hard for you. But he ensures us that once we start doing it, we'll get better at it and we'll be able to go longer with giving our mind that room to think. He says as soon as we do that, these ideas will start to take form. They'll make their solutions known. And without that constant interruption, we'll do better and we'll come up with better ideas. He says that you should make sure that that idea grows and has time to take root, gel a little bit more before our busy, structured harebrain takes over. Then when we realize we've thought this out, maybe we're getting bored and we're starting to wander away, then we can just snap out of it, listen to the voice that we had inside of our unconscious, and get back to solving the problem. But he says that process of using our unconscious mind to let it go and then having our conscious mind try to structure things, he calls it iteration. And that's what creative people who are good at their jobs, that's what they do all the time. And that we need both that structured brain and that unstructured, unconscious brain, but we can't do it at the same time. We have to give each of them room inside our decision-making process so that they have a chance to run a little bit to come up with the best solution possible. He finds it a bit funny that when people are trying to write for the first time, a lot of established authors will say, well, write what you know. And of course, that's obvious. But you can also take ideas, he says, from people that you admire, who you would like to think like someday or who you would like to write like or be creative like. Take some of their ideas as a starting point and then bounce your own idea off of it, making it your own. Learning from people that you admire, that you think are pretty good, will help you become better and help you stand on their shoulders to not make an exact copy and not forge their idea and not steal what it is they're known for, but instead take something that they made and make it yours. Make a direction of creativity, something that feels like you. So he suggests some ideas about what you can do in order to get creative. He says, first of all, you should know who your audience is. If I'm at work and I'm trying to come up with creative solution for my customers, I have to know what role they play so I know how to solve their problem. If I'm making a podcast, who do I expect will listen to the podcast? He says, keep it short. Make sure that you're in that right frame of mind when you're going to do some writing or some creative work. Suggest going for a walk and make sure that you have a notebook or something that you can write your ideas down with you. Then go through your writing and your creative process or your troubleshooting, whatever it is you're trying to think about, and look for the mistakes. Look for the places in your writing where you're getting bored. Because if you're getting bored in a part of your writing, or you're part of your podcast, probably someone else is getting bored too. I remember when I first started this podcast and I first started recording and I wasn't entirely sure how long I was going to make this podcast. One of the first episodes I did, I was listening back to it and editing it and I just found myself drifting away. And it struck me, if I'm really bored in this segment, you're going to be really bored too. So when you're going through and you're looking for the bad spots, you're looking for the boring parts, you're looking for the stuff that doesn't make sense. When you go through it back in your head, once you're done getting your ideas down, that's when you'll go in and start editing your ideas. So this book was a quick read. I thought it was interesting and it 
comes from someone as a comedian, an actor, and a writer who spent his whole life being creative. And I thought it was nice that he tried to figure out a way to help all of us who think we're not particularly creative people find a way to be more creative, probably because we're not listening to our unconscious mind. So my challenge to you is take a problem that you have this week, then sit in a room that's very quiet, play in your mind, think about it, think about tinkering with the idea, turning it over in your head a bit, maybe even go for a walk with that notepad in hand. Then see after this creative, uninterrupted time, if you found a better solution to your problems, or maybe at least a more creative solution to your problems. Then, if you found it worthy and you found it was something that was helping you out, then incorporate that in your creative thinking going forward. Hi everyone, thanks so much. If you had some trouble with my website last week, I had a little bit of trouble with my website too, and I got it back up and running again. So please remember to subscribe and tell a friend that they can get more creative by taking small steps.